everybody. Thanks, guys. All right, time to welcome our next guest. Our next guest is one of Fortune's most powerful women entrepreneurs. She's on the Forbes 30 Under 30 in tech list and was named by Fast Company as one of the 100 most creative people in the industry. She's the founder CEO of Peak, an amazing company that has offices here in Utah disrupting the $110 billion global activities market. Please join me in welcoming on stage the incredible Razwana Bashir. Awesome. I didn't realize the chairs were over here. <laughs> I had to look for a second. <laughs> Razwana, so good to have you here in Utah with us today. Um, pretty incredible, right? Silicon Slopes. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah. Impressed that there's 14,000 people that are registered as I well. Know. Standing room only. Here we go. So uh, let's dive right in. I want to, your, your story is so impressive and so interesting. I want people here to get every bit of it we can squeeze in in the time we have. Tell us a little bit about Peak and where the idea came from. Sure. So Peak is a platform for activities. Um, so we help uh, you know, consumers um, to have a one-stop shop to find great experiences. So if you want to go paintballing or kayaking or you want to go on an art tour, um, you can come to peak.com and find great things to do. And we actually also work with the small businesses that do those experiences to help them come online. Um, to help them find a way to be able to get online booking, but also grow their business. So on average, when we start working with, uh, with businesses um, with their website, they see an increase of about 30% in their bookings. So we're doing both things, helping consumers and small businesses. Got it. So if I'm on the beach in Miami and I want to go paragliding, yeah. you know, uh, there's a chance that if I walk up to the tour company there, they might be using Peak? Yep, absolutely. Um, so we essentially um, will be running all of the back end for them, allowing them to take payments and, and, and all the online booking and, and everything on site. So, you know, guides who are running around the city or on the beach will be using our apps to be able to run the business. Got it. And then there's also peak.com, which is a destination that anyone here could go to to discover that for themselves. Absolutely. So if you want to find something fun to do, maybe you've got friends visiting this weekend, maybe you want to do something fun with your kids, you'll be able to find great things to do there. So where did the idea come from? Like what spurred you to do this? Um, so I went on a trip to Istanbul um, and uh, that was pretty far away. And so I spent several hours researching all these fun experiences because I wasn't going for the, the hotel I was staying at. I was going to go to have these really cool things that I could do. Um, it took hours. I had to make all these phone calls to arrange it. And I didn't understand why something like OpenTable didn't exist for activities. And as I dug more into it, I realized it was a massive market. So it's about $110 billion globally, as you mentioned, $30 billion in the US. But it's made up of all these small businesses. And there wasn't one place that I could go that I could trust to be able to find those things to do. So that's how the inspiration started. I've felt that many times. I mean, whenever I go to a new place, a new city, like I have that same thought, like, OK, how do I find out? Like, what are the activities I would really want to do here? And so I could see how that would be really appealing. Actually, 40% of the activities booked on our platform are ha happening with people in their own city as well. Oh, really? So people are yeah. saying, yeah, like, I want to try an escape room or I want to, you know, I want to do some of these things that uh, I could do any time that I wanted to. So it's actually fun to see how much people are doing things in their own city. So if you're a Utahan, that means you would actually find out that skiing in Utah is actually a thing. Yeah, you guys should do that. You but know, you can like also it, go zip lining and you can also do a whole lot of other things that are really it's funny, fun. Like the people that live in Utah probably don't ski as much as the people that like travel into Utah. And like there are so many amazing things here within the state of Utah. It's that's awesome. I gotta go check it out afterwards, see what's see what's out there. Um, so any big obstacles or surprises in starting this thing, like anything that you learned in the, in the early days? Yeah, um, I think when we started the business, we saw it from a consumer viewpoint. So we were like, wow, you know, I want to find great things to do. What can I, you know, how can I have a site that helps me? As time went on, we actually realized that the small businesses that do this have even bigger challenges. Mm. So you know, imagine you are a business and you're providing these services. Like, 
all the consumers have gone online. In fact, they're pulling out their phone and they're wanting to book a few hours in advance. Mm. So over half of the activities that happen on the P platform happen less than 24 hours in advance. So people are booking last minute and they're expecting to use their phone to find these great things to do. And yet, if you're a small business owner, maybe you've been doing your business, you've done you know, boat tours in Florida for 30 years. But when it comes to this whole world of online, you've no idea what to do. And so actually, we ended up focusing a lot of our attention on building software tools for them so that when they are on the beach or in the middle of a swamp, they can still use technology and software and be able to provide a great experience on the technology end for the consumers. So we ended up spending a lot of our time and our energy on building that. And my co-founder's background actually is in enterprise software. Mm. Um, and so that was really helpful. So we were able to build these great tools for businesses. And that was something we weren't expecting and, and how heavy it was going to be in mobile. Because actually a lot of the businesses we work with are not, they're not behind a desk. Yeah, makes sense. So if, we have, so if we have small business owners here in the room that are in the activities space, you know, they could come to your platform to, to basically modernize the way they you know, deliver their experience out to their customers by signing up on the business side. Is that how that works? Absolutely. And then they can use our tools. And the average business that works with us, we've collected um, almost 400,000 reviews and ratings now um, for the businesses that work with us. And of those, it's a 4.8 star average rating. So we're actually really helping them to deliver a better consumer experience. Got it. OK, so let's switch gears here a little bit. I want to talk about your education and your background. Um, your, your pedigree is impressive here. You went to Oxford, Harvard Business School. You were a Fulbright Scholar. Um, and, you know, all really impressive uh, credentials there. And uh, I'm just curious, like, like, talk to us about your beginning and how, you, and how you moved through that and then what that's done for you in your career. Sure. So I had a slightly unusual start to, to kind of becoming a tech entrepreneur. Um, my parents moved from Pakistan and first generation immigrants into the UK, uh, into a small town in Yorkshire. And so, you know, I grew up in an environment where actually, you know, my mom didn't speak English. Both my parents don't read or write in English. Um, and, um, you know, it was a very pretty poor community, um, and there wasn't a lot of access to either education or careers. None of the women that I knew had a job. They didn't work. And there was, there was very little access to jobs that went beyond very uh, blue collar kind of opportunities. And so growing up in that environment, I didn't have a sense that you could be a CEO. I didn't know what that meant. I definitely didn't know what San Francisco was. And so for me, um, I was just really intellectually curious, loved school, loved learning, and ended up um, being able to do well enough at school to be able to apply to Oxford uh, and get a scholarship and go. And so Oxford ended up, for me, being this huge opportunity where I got there and I was a little different to everybody else because I, I you know, didn't come from those traditional backgrounds, but it allowed me to be able to get um, the opportunity to do a whole load of different things. Um, so it was a very, very impactful moment. And had I not had that access to education, I definitely wouldn't be here today. And that sort of led to all these other accomplishments for you. So what was it in, for you that allowed you to see that that would be a possibility? Like, what even, like, how did that yeah. come into your mind? I had a teacher that had gone to Cambridge, um, and that was by chance. Um, and so suddenly that was something that I could do because she'd gone there. Um, and I think if I hadn't had that, I would never have thought that it was possible for me to go to those kind of universities and then, you know, was fortunate enough to be able to get in and get that opportunity. So it was an amazing teacher who opened up your mind to this possibility. Yeah. Do we have any teachers here today? Give it up for all the amazing teachers in Utah. There's, there's something really profound in that, you know, just being able to see it, see the possibility. You said you didn't see the possibility of being a CEO. Like, when did you first see that? Well, I think, um, you know, once I got to a place like Oxford and I started meeting people who were doing those kind of things, all of a sudden it became really interesting. I, I always knew that I wanted to start my own business or be some kind of, do something entrepreneurial, um, but it was only once I was at university and then I started working uh, at Blackstone um, in London, which you know, is a finance firm doing private equity, and I suddenly got exposure to all this world of business and thought, wow, I think I could do this and I think I'd really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, often it takes someone else to help us you know, see things and uh, super interesting to me. So then you, at Oxford, you ended up becoming the president of the Oxford Union, which I didn't really know much about before I started researching this. And 
Um, apparently, there have been five prime ministers who were also the president of the Oxford Union. It's like a debate society type thing um, where you refine your skills, your, your communication skills, leadership skills. Um, and tell me about that. Like, so is that, was that, how did that come to be and like, what did that do for you? Sure. So when I got to the Oxford, this was one of the big things that you could kind of potentially do as a student. Um, and you basically had lots of famous people come in and speak. So, um, you know, lots of presidents and, 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 and Nobel Prize winners and things like that have spoken at the Oxford Union um, since it started in 1823. Um, and so I suddenly, you know, you'd be sitting next to a Nobel Prize winner or, you know, John McCain came and spoke and Madeleine Albright came and spoke. And it really opened up my view of what was achievable in the world and the impact that you could have. So I'd say that actually was probably uh, one of the most impactful experiences for me was being able to sit down and have dinner and, and debate and, 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 and talk with these people that were world leaders in whatever field it was, whether it's economics or, or politics or anything else, um, that was a really impactful thing. So do you see the possibility of being prime minister? <laughs> um, not yet. <laughs> well, you said you didn't see the possibility of being a CEO either. And indeed, now you're indeed. A CEO, you never know. So, you know, anything's possible. Um, so that's great. Um, you know, in, uh, in Fortune, you said, what I went through growing up prepared me well for entrepreneurship. I had to fight for a lot of things and I developed a grit that has really paid off. And I've used the word grit a lot to describe what's happening here in Utah. You know, it takes grit here to build a company. And historically, there hasn't been capital. There hasn't been a lot of the things that people, you know, are used to having when they start companies. So, you know, tell me, you know, and, and typically for women too, you know, as a woman, as a woman founder, you know, it's not easy to get capital either. They typically get a lot less capital than the men do. So talk to me about this principle of grit for you and, and what it's, how it's helped you succeed. Sure. I think um, one of the things from coming from a slightly different environment has been that, you know, I... Uh, you know, to, to be good at school, that, a lot of that was self-motivated, right? Um, so I was kind of, I was the nerdy kid that when you were like told to write two, two pages for an essay, I wrote like 10, and that was, but I was doing that at the age of, <laughs> at the age of nine and onwards. And so I think that um, it was always knowing that you had, you should do more if you can and putting the most work in that you can and even getting to Oxford, it was just, it felt very different when I got there um, and I was unusual, the Oxford Union, all of these kind of challenges and, and frankly failing a lot, right? Um, there, it hasn't been a situation where um, in life, you know, I've always succeeded in all the things that I've tried. There's been a lot of failures. And so I think every time you have to get back up after those failures helps you develop grit. Um, every time that something is tremendously challenging um, or you felt like you couldn't achieve it and you do, you also develop those muscles. And so I think sometimes I think we live in a world where we're, we're not, um, you know, we want to help people get those opportunities in an easier fashion. But if something's handed to you, you're not as likely to be able to get back up when bad things happen or you don't succeed. And in entrepreneurship, frankly, you hear a lot of no's, right? And I'm sure yeah. you did when you started your business. Um, we've raised about $25 million now, but you know, by God, there were a lot of people who said no or who said that wasn't a good idea. Um, and so I think given that, you have to have resilience and grit and resilience go together. And I think in Utah especially, there's an emerging group of entrepreneurs who didn't have as much access to Valley funding and have had to kind of carve out their own paths. And I think a lot of that's being able to take those no's, to fall over and be able to get back up again. And I think that is something that you can train and, and get better at, but it's, it's really about being willing to get into the arena more than anything else. I agree, yeah. I mean, for me, you know, grit, grit is probably the best word to describe it. You know, and there's Angela Duckworth's book called Grit that describes this principle in depth and a lot of, just a lot of uh, thinking around this. A lot of investors now look at this principle of grit as sort of the filter, should I invest in this business? Like it has a lot more to do with the entrepreneur than the idea. Like Especially early stage. Exactly, early stage, like you're gonna hit those things. Things aren't gonna work out exactly like you thought and can you push through it, it's awesome. So then, so then after, after your schooling in Oxford, you went to Blackstone, like you said, and then something inspired you to become an entrepreneur. What was that? Like what was sure. the thing? Um, I always knew that um, 
I had this desire to build something from scratch. Um, so when I was working at Blackstone, we would like buy companies. And so when I was there, we bought companies like Hilton in the hotel space. And, yeah. um, and that was great, but I realized I wanted to be in those companies building them. And I think I got really excited about that. And so I came to America um, on a Fulbright scholarship to go to Harvard Business School. And when I got there, all of a sudden, there were all these tech companies that were emerging. And I started getting access to the American startup scene. And it, I just got so excited about the fact that you could build something, um, put it on the web, and then and allow it to actu actually access millions of people. And so that was the point at which I got really excited about technology companies. Um, and I think you know when you combine having enough of a skill set around being able to know what you're doing on the finance side with a passion for a specific space, that can lead to you being able to build great businesses. Yeah, I mean, did you did you expect to be an entrepreneur like when you were going through school, or did that hit yeah. you? Yeah. I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I got to, to school, and yeah. I, I thought that would be a good stepping stone for me. Awesome. That's great. And now you're in Utah. I am. You, you haven't so talked to us about Peaks, Utah presence, and why. Why are you here? Sure. So we um, started building out our office uh, in, in, in Salt Lake City, in, in, in Sandy, actually, um, uh, just uh, about 18 months ago. And it really um, was because we have... We're headquartered in San Francisco, but we were really excited about being able to build an office somewhere else as well. Um, we know that over the long term, we'll be probably a global company with many offices in different places. And so um, we were looking at a number of different locations, uh, and we just got super excited about Utah. It's very clear that there's an amazing workforce here, really bright, well-educated workforce um, that is really now becoming much more interested in tech. Um, and there was a burgeoning tech center that we could see. Um, there were other companies that we knew that were beginning to move here. And I think for us as a company as well, we wanted somewhere that had a lot of activities. We wanted people who are passionate about it. And what I love about this area is how many people end up flocking here because they're actually really into outdoor activities yeah. and, and adventure. And so all of those things combined. Um, we actually have a lot of people who work in sales here in, 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 in our office here. And so this is also something that I know that the, uh, the Utah area has become really great at. Um, it's one of the only places that has um, um, you know, a university where you can actually get a degree in sales, which I think is really important. So all of those things combined. And so today we have a great office here. Um, we're hiring. So if anybody is out there, you know, we're going from senior leadership all the way through to somebody who's starting their career um, to be able to join us here. And we've loved our experience and the team here is awesome. And so I love being able to come here often. Well, we love having you here, don't we? Yeah. So awesome to see amazing companies like yours uh, see that in Utah and then see the opportunity and then actually, you know, go create it, go build something like you're doing here. And we're so happy to have you guys here within the state to see what you're doing. What exciting things do you guys have coming in 18? Like what, what's going on? Sure. So we're, we're growing a lot in 18. And so I think, you know, as time's gone on, more and more of our growth as a company is coming here. Um, so it's really around us being able to attract great talent. In 2018, we as a company, you know, we've um, really grown a lot. We've grown about 20x in the last two or three years. And so um, that has meant that we have tens of millions of dollars of bookings going through our platform every month. Um, and in order to allow that to continue to happen, we need to grow uh, the talent that we have. And it's very clear that we've been able to build an amazing culture here, which, um, you know, for Peak is around uh, passion for learning, a lot of personal development. I think one of the, you know, because there's been a lot of more traditional companies here, having a tech company where the approach is really around investing in talent and helping everybody grow and be the best that they can be every day, I think that's been a, an unusual thing. Um, I think when there's been traditional um, companies where you come in to do your nine to five and you start having this burgeoning tech center, you get a very different experience for everybody. Um, so people who come and work at Peak, yes, you know, they're going to be working really hard and they're going to learn a lot, but they're also going to develop all these skills they couldn't have had otherwise. Um, and so I think that's, you know, all of what we're going to be doing is really continuing to scale and execute, but also bringing great talent into the company. So what kind of uh, job openings do you have? Um, we're looking for uh, a VP of sales, we're looking for sales reps, we're looking for people to come and join us on success, um, as well as uh, in, in operations, so a whole swathe of different jobs and opportunities. Awesome, awesome. Peak.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that sales role, that VP of sales role is like a small business sales role, right? Yeah. That's what that looks like. Okay, so I want to I shift gears here in the few minutes we have left. 
and finish on a, on a few important notes. Um, you know, right now we're in an interesting time in the industry where sexism is in the news every day. Um, you know, there are a lot of women coming out and coming forward because they're able to, they have the courage to. There's something's happened here recently that's created this opening, this space for that to happen. And it's sort of raised the awareness around this issue in a really powerful way. It's also starting to hold businesses and leaders accountable to what's been happening in the past. And stating the obvious, you're a female uh, founder from a different country. Um, just curious, what are your thoughts around this issue and what advice would you offer the men here in Silicon Slopes and Silicon Valley, both, who want to create a more just, equal workplace for women? Um, so I think the reason that we're seeing this kind of effectively avalanche of information coming out is that actually for a lot, long time, a lot of women have been in positions, especially in the workplace, where they haven't had the same level of opportunity all the way through to getting harassed. Um, I think the opportunity you have now, I hope, is not to switch off. I think a lot of men may be intimidated by this conversation, but I think it's really about giving more opportunity. So I think the things that everyone can do is, you know, please mentor people, right? One of the things that women in, um, in tech especially, but also in, 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 in other companies have is that they might not have the same level of, of access to senior leadership. Um, and I think often we gravitate towards people who look like us, who went yeah. to the same university, who have the same passions and interests. Yeah. And so when there's uh, something different about that person, maybe it's a different gender, maybe it's a different race, um, it, can, it can mean that we don't find that connection as easily, but do invest in that and make sure that you are spending those times perhaps having a breakfast and a lunch with a potential female mentor. Um, look at the way that you're hiring and make sure that there isn't a lot of bias around that because actually, um, as humans, we can't help it. We prefer people who remind us of ourselves in some ways. And so I think being both um, cognitive about around your biases as well as giving specific opportunities for mentorship for female leaders um, allows us to hopefully start rectifying some of that stuff alongside just establishing these firm boundaries about what is and isn't acceptable. Yeah. And we have the Parity Pledge, parity.org. We've been talking about that today with Catherine and a lot of good things happening here in Utah. We're seeing a lot of examples of amazing leadership around this issue that I'm really proud of. Um, so to close out here, um, you wrote an essay in 2014 that was really powerful. And um, in that, there was a quote that reads, um, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And then you said in your essay, the last sentence, let's not be those people. And I couldn't agree more. Um, can you please share with everyone here, how is it that we... Like, how, how, how can we not be those people? Yeah. So I think today we, like, live in a world where often, um, certainly I did for myself, is you wait to be able to tackle some of these issues around our society or problems that are out there um, until we're kind of later in our career or, or at some other point where you have the time to tackle it. I think if there's something that you're passionate about, if there's something that you feel is really unjust or unfair in, in the world that you want to tackle, I think the sooner you can do it, the better. And if that means bringing it into what you do um, every day, maybe it's in your life and you carve out an extra few hours each week, all the way through to maybe even bringing it into your company, like you, you guys have done with the Parity Pledge, like this is an important issue, we're going to put ourselves behind it. I think that's really, really important. So for me, um, I think whatever it is that you might see that you see in the world and you don't think is right, Right? Um, remember that you have an incredible voice. We all do. It doesn't matter who you are. You have more of a voice today, especially with the amplification that's possible with our networks and social media and things like that, to have a voice and to have an impact. And I hope each of us will come in and, and step forward on the issues that we care about. Awesome. Awesome note to end on. Rosanna, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Rosanna and Aaron. Thank you both.